We all have skills we want to get better at, whether it's learning a new instrument, improving your speaking ability, or playing a sport. However, we rarely think about the ultimate meta skill, which is learning how to learn. What if we could take time-tested strategies and principles that masters in specific fields use and apply those to our own lives? This is what Josh Waitzkin teaches in his memoir, The Art of Learning, An Inner Journey to Optimal Performance. Waitzkin is a master of learning any new skill. As a child, he was a chess prodigy winning international master status and several national chess competitions. Then at the age of 18, he picked up Tai Chi and won the world championship in Taiwan. Afterwards, he mastered Jiu Jitsu and is currently learning competitive surfing. In this video, I'm gonna take you through six key learning principles that Waitzkin teaches in his book. The first lesson Waitzkin teaches is the difference between entity and incremental learning which are the two theories of intelligence. The entity model sees intelligence as this predetermined fixed thing that you can't really change. The people who intuitively believe in the entity model use phrases like, I'm naturally good at this, this class is impossible, and I just can't do this subject. The other model of intelligence, the incremental model, is a subtly different mindset. This model sees intelligence as this ever-evolving construct. The people who practice this mindset believe that with enough time and the right process, they can get pretty good at anything they want to. The incremental learners are much more systems focused. They like to nail down their process and let time work its magic. So what's the difference between these two kinds of learners and how does this manifest in overall performance? Studies have shown that when faced with difficult material, those who genuinely believe they can improve are much more likely to rise to the level of the task. In one study, researchers gave different groups of children a difficult mathematics test. Through an interview process, they determined which kids had an entity versus an incremental mindset. During the first round of the test, everyone missed the difficult problems. However, the entity learners use language like I'm not smart enough for this, whereas the incremental learners were mostly excited for the challenge. Their most groundbreaking result occurred in the second portion of the exam. The groups were given the exact same test later on. While the incremental learners flew through the early problems, the entity learners were still crushed by them. Their low self-confidence poisoned their results even the second time around. These results have nothing to do with general intelligence. Kids of all levels are affected by subtle differences in mindset. This is the basis for the growth mindset. Having the idea that you can largely gain any skill given enough time, effort, and training has a massive impact on your long-term performance. If you genuinely believe you can incrementally improve, your progress will massively increase. The second thing Waitzkin focuses on is the concept of the flow state. The flow state is the feeling of optimal performance and complete focus that people have when they are fully immersed in a specific activity. This is the state that you want to achieve. You have no external lines of thought going on and are performing at your highest level. You're in the zone, you think of nothing but the task at hand. Obviously, you want to be in the flow state whenever you're doing any sort of competitive or performing art. This is why Waitzkin focuses much of his book on one, how to achieve the flow state, and two, how to preserve it for as long as possible. Waitzkin first talks about the differences between the hard zone and the soft zone. Picture this. To enter the flow state, you have to perfectly set up your environment. You turn on your favorite music, maybe put your phone in a different room, or have a cup of coffee. While you might be in the flow state, this kind of flow is extremely brittle. As soon as one thing goes wrong, someone bothers you, there's traffic on the road, you immediately lose focus. In other words, you have zero resilience because you're completely dependent on your external environment, something you can't always control. This is the hard zone. Now consider this. You're completely focused, but the approach you use stands from within. This means that no matter what your external environment, you can always stay in flow. You're like a blade of grass in the wind, bendable, adaptable, and relaxed. This is the soft zone and what you want to achieve. So how do you actually achieve the soft zone? One way is to take a potential external distraction and train yourself to adapt to it. For example, when he was younger, Waitzkin would often struggle with songs getting stuck in his head. He could listen to a catchy song, but days later it would destroy his chess games because it'd be stuck in his head when he was trying to think. The way he adapted was he literally started to think to the beat of the music. Instead of trying to expel the music from his mind, he bent and adjusted to it. The best way to maintain flow is to use the soft zone. You want to practice a series of techniques that you can use to maintain flow anywhere regardless of the environment. One of these techniques is called a flow trigger. A flow trigger is a practice technique that you can use to bring back your focus as soon as you get distracted. For example, Waitzkin started mastering Tai Chi 
Shi in his early 20s. After a few months, he started to notice that whenever he became distracted, he could simply practice a short Tai Chi meditation and immediately retain focus. This is the power of a flow trigger. Here's how you can create a flow trigger in three easy steps. First, think about the times in your life that you're 100% focused and in the zone. Try to isolate what exactly surrounds that moment. Most people genuinely have these periods of blissful focus, but they dismiss them as taking a break. For example, when you're a parent, playing a game with your kid automatically puts you in the zone. You're not trying to focus, you just enjoy the activity so much it happens by default. For me, I get in the zone every time I listen to film scores or jazz music. When I really like the song, I become fully immersed within it without really trying at all. Now you're going to create a multi-step routine which tricks your brain into being focused. Then repeat this routine every time before you engage in that blissful activity. I'll give you my example. For the past few months, I've been practicing this routine. First, I make a cup of coffee and eat a granola bar. Then I meditate for five minutes. Finally, I listen to some of my favorite music. After all of that, I'm pretty focused and ready to work. However, this routine is pretty long. This is why as time goes on, you incrementally reduce each of those steps. Now all I have to do is eat a granola bar or listen to just two minutes of music and I'm immediately in the flow state. A physiological connection has been formed between these arbitrary activities and my state of focus. The next idea Waitskin discusses is the concept of form to leave form. A lot of different skills have a set methodology that you must master before you can move on. Let's use chess as an example. When you learn to play chess, every piece has a relative point value attached to it. A pawn is worth 1, a knight or bishop is worth 3, a rook is worth 5, and the queen is worth 9. In the beginning, players will keep count by continuously adding everything up. However, after a long time of doing this, the process will become intuitive and you'll start to feel the relative scores without actually keeping track. This is form to leave form. You practice the form for so long that it just becomes natural and then you can leave it. This concept exists within pretty much every skill. Within a language, there are hundreds of grammar rules that you have to struggle to follow when you first start learning it. However, after years of practice, you aren't really thinking about the rules anymore. Anything that breaks those rules just sounds wrong. You use form to leave form. The main takeaway from this is that you have to do things slowly by the book before you have any hope of doing them fast. People like to rush through those early steps, but those are often the most important. Another concept Waitskin talks about is depth over breadth. This principle is centered around diving into the small micro elements that build up any complex technique. You practice each micro step of a technique over and over again until it becomes fully internalized. Most people attempt to focus on the flashy, overarching techniques of any art. However, Waitskin explains that it's much more important to drill down to the very core principles that permeate the skill. Let's talk about weightlifting. There are hundreds of different exercises that you could do per workout. Most people think that they have to do a dozen lifts per session. They think this because it presents the illusion of progress and effort. However, there are actually four key heavy compound lifts that form the backbone of all lifting. Instead of doing a bunch of random isolation exercises, you should work on mastering the form of these four lifts. If you drill down as close as possible to perfecting these four techniques, you'll have much more success. The final two ideas Waitskin talks about are related to making mistakes. The first is resisting the downward spiral. Often our small initial mistakes don't really affect that much. Waitskin states, The first mistake rarely proves disastrous, but the downward spiral of the second, third, and fourth error creates a devastating chain reaction. This is especially prevalent within the competitive arts. Every sports fan has seen games lost or won by subtle psychological shifts. Momentum is incredibly important in any competitive experience. Things don't always go according to your expectations. A big mistake people make is they create these detailed, perfect laid out plans. When one thing goes wrong, that triggers fear and uncertainty, which causes a downward spiral. In other words, the top people in any field have the ability to effortlessly improvise. The best way to prevent a downward spiral is to recognize your emotional response after making one mistake. It's really easy to let one error destroy your mindset if you don't know what's happening. To prevent this, all you have to do is recognize when you're becoming distracted by your first mistake and try to clear your head, either by taking a walk or a few deep breaths. Finally, you must invest in your mistakes. Often, the only way to grow is to lose and heavily analyze where you messed up. For example, let's talk about standardized testing. The first time people start really taking standardized tests is usually in high school. A lot of people are worried about taking that very first practice test because they haven't prepared at all and they're worried they're gonna do badly. However, you can't effectively improve unless you bite the bullet and take that first practice test. There are no real consequences 
nuances to doing this other than bruising your ego. It will brutally show you all of your shortcomings and help you train in the proper places. I used to have this feeling a lot when preparing for band auditions in high school. In the beginning, when I got my new music and was getting ready to compete, I would be very reluctant to play my audition all the way through. This was because I didn't know a lot of the music and to play it all the way through would be to admit to myself that I just wasn't ready. I felt it so much easier to just practice what I knew because of that ego boost. However, I'd never get better unless I allowed myself to fail, at least at first. When learning a new skill, making mistakes is fine. The important part comes after you make them. Wadeskin states, if a student of virtually any discipline could avoid ever repeating the same mistake twice, both technical and psychological, he or she would skyrocket to the top of their field. Most people refuse to honestly admit their mistakes. They try to cover them up to prevent being embarrassed. However, if you openly and rigorously examine every error, you will grow much faster than your peer. To truly succeed, you must have a willingness to put yourself on the line. In conclusion, here's a recap of the six concepts I covered in this video. First, you can't effectively learn a new skill if you don't believe in yourself. The growth mindset, the idea that you can improve to a decent level with time and effort is a necessary precondition for learning. Second, you want to preserve the flow state for as long as possible. The best way to do this is to create an internal flow trigger, a routine that immediately helps you focus. Third, you must internalize key concepts before you have any hope of expanding on them. This is the concept of form to leave form. You practice the form for so long that it just becomes natural and then you can leave it. Four, focus on depth over breadth. Most people attempt to practice flashy, overarching techniques, but it's much more important to drill down to the very core principles which permeate the skill. Fifth, resist the downward spiral. Don't let one mistake cause another. Try to regain your psychological bearing right after you mess up. Finally, rigorously analyze every mistake so you can grow. Sometimes you have to lose so you can later on win. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.